Labor's Own Day is the first Monday in September. Toronto trade unionists march in the largest Labor Day parade on the North American continent. 83 years of tradition march with them. In 1872, Toronto workers first paraded in support of a printer's strike. The theme of the 1955 parade is unity. This is the last parade in which Canada's two major labor congresses march separately. 3,500 TLC members with 2,100 of their CCL brothers pass in a three-hour continuous review. Twenty-two floats compete for prizes. The Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union takes the TLC trophy. And the rubber workers win in the CCL contest. All floats are union-made and driven by union drivers, of course. A beautiful union maid, Sheila Billing, Miss Toronto of 1955. Her local, UAW 439, wins second prize in the float competition. TLC President Claude Jodoin proceeds to the special luncheon at the exhibition grounds. Legal holiday in Canada since 1894, the Labor Day show gets bigger and better every year. Canadian TLC and CCL trade unionists participate in their second United Nations tour. Members of the joint group are welcomed by the Honorable Paul Martin, Minister of Health and Welfare and head of the Canadian delegation to the UN. Mr. Martin discusses the admission of 16 new countries to membership in the world body. Later, touring the building, the Canadians are briefed on the functions of the General Assembly and UN committees. The tours are an important part of the TLC-CCL International Study Program. Their international guides explain the meaning of the decorative murals, representing the work of world-famous artists from all parts of the globe. <laughs> Seminars and discussions on international affairs held at New York's Hotel Shelburne are an important feature of the study tour. Ms. Tony Sender tells how the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions participates in the work of the UN. Democratic labor looks to this agency for help in achieving its goals, international peace and rising living standards. From the richly wooded areas of Ontario and Quebec, the Ottawa River brings raw material to the E.B. Eddy Company, one of the nation's most important pulp and paper producers. Wood fiber, chemicals, and machinery play their part in paper making, but the key ingredient is men. In a company located in two provinces divided by the Ontario-Quebec border, French-speaking Canadians work side by side in harmony with their English-speaking brothers. Six local unions, three from each province, represent the mill employees, the paper makers, pulp and sulfite workers, and machinists. <laughs> The Eddy pattern for industrial peace is based on a simple formula. Labor and management tackle every new problem the moment it arises. Before hard feelings can grow, an answer is found. In six years, the unions have not filed a single formal grievance. To meet the constant demand for paper products, men and machines must work steadily, three shifts a day, six days a week. The alarm signals an emergency breakdown. A power failure cuts off the newsprint machine and production stops. Details are relayed to Derek Curry, manager of manufacturing. Paper Makers Union president Marcel Fournier is called in. The company is worried. Customers' orders can't be filled. Will the union drop its opposition to Sunday work during this emergency?
Fournier puts the matter to his members. The papermakers are traditionally opposed to Sunday work, and many express strong disapproval. Finally, the men vote to give up their day off, but only for this emergency. The contract will not be changed. After church, the day shift reports for work. Another live issue is solved through collective bargaining. Very often it's the little things which cause the most trouble. Wood handling is hot work. The men in this department are always griping about the terrible drinking water. They get especially mad in hot weather. In the old-fashioned water coolers, the ice is gone before you know it. The foreman sympathizes, but what can he do about it? It's just one of those things you have to put up with. The wood handlers decide to submit a complaint to their departmental committee. After discussion, a request for modern fountains is drafted. Workers in other departments are interested in the outcome. They've kicked about the warm drinking water, too. The committee convinces Superintendent Ace Powell that the problem is important enough to be considered by the overall plant committee. In the plant committee, unions and companies settle all unresolved issues in regular monthly meetings. Item one on the agenda, a request for better drinking water facilities. The union argues that modern fountains would benefit the company as well as the employees. The trouble and expense of distributing ice throughout the mills would be avoided. Curry agrees that the request is reasonable and promises prompt action. In a few weeks, the wood handlers enjoy cold drinking water at the press of a button. The Eddy plan can claim other achievements. Vending machines supplying sandwiches and soft drinks for those necessary breaks in factory routine. Another negotiation produced new sanitary shower and locker rooms, replacing the old crowded facilities. The newest problem to plague industrial relations is automation. At Eddy's, working together, management and the unions make sure displaced workers are transferred to other jobs at no loss of pay. Before a new machine is installed, the workers receive instructions in its operation. When necessary, they go to the United States for on-the-job training at company expense. When installation is completed, production can begin immediately. The men are familiar with their new jobs and go right to work. after the new machine starts, paper is rolling. Confidence and skill give a man pride in his work. The strength of his union behind him gives him dignity. In this atmosphere, industrial democracy can be achieved. A responsible trade union membership and the progressive management working together make the eddy pattern for industrial peace.